feedlots. Colorado, southwest Kansas, and the panhandle areas of Texas and Oklahoma. How do the feedlots buy out there? They'll come into the market for about a 90 to 120 day supply, and then they are out. What do we have by moving our commodities? Well, in wheat, we use trucks, and these are primarily backhaul trucks that come out of Kansas City into Denver, and then take grain back. We also have two reloads there, one at Micro, Nebraska, which we use, and it's strictly a scale, 10 inch auger, and enough siding for about five cars. There is also another reload in the process to be put into action at Kobe, Kansas. On this, we'll have, to act, have access to two rail lines, the Rock Island and the UP. The feed grains move out of there. At the present time, we're using what's known as the broker who provides the wheels. It's quite interesting. In running around in Colorado, particularly in the Rocky Ford area, which has three feedlots there, and this was back in about April or May, there's a need there for 15 loads of corn every day of the year. And it's all got to come in there because there is very little pro corn produced in that area. What needs to be done, build the volume and go directly to them. And it's, it's wide open. As far as participation and the volume, for the last year it's doubled in the Sterling area. Thank you. Dwayne Leach is in the North and South St. Paul area of Minnesota. Thank you, Ralph. I'd like to know how many of you were here the other night and heard Vance Combs' presentation of the R6 program. Let me see the hands. Then if I were to talk about the R6 program, there would be I think about 80% that would not understand what I'm talking about. And so I'm not going to go into that part of it, but I want to point out a couple differences in what is happening in our area in relation to what has been said here at the meeting today as far as the contract for sale. The immediate sale on the contract for sale of all the contracts to come through our office means that it's going to be sold immediately. As soon as that has cleared the home office and reached the bargainer, who in our case is Larry Freeman up at the Minneapolis office, it's going to be sold if that immediate sale is checked. We do not recommend that it be checked. We would rather that the grain be moved into Section 1 and made available for bargaining. And therein lies the basis of our program up there, and I want to read this line, and it says, this grain is available for sale and may be sold in accordance with the bargaining efforts of NFO. It does not mean it has to be sold today, tomorrow, next week, or next month. It's going to be sold in accordance with the bargaining efforts. And that's why we are here. That's why we work with the bargainers. That's why we have the advisors in the home office to know what is in the best interest as far as collective bargaining, as far as you, the members, are concerned. I wanted to read part of what Vance had the other night, and we call it three proclamations is what I've got it down as, and I want to read one, two, and three. And number one is, any group who fails to create its own system is doomed to serve another. Number two, when the system breaks down and there's no other to take over, you have chaos. Number three, any group who refuses to contract a service or commodity that is essential to a basic industry will then have that service or commodity forced into that basic industry by repressive means. By repressive means. In other words, if you've got a bill to pay, you're going to have to sell some grain. And we believe it's much better that you let us know that you have a deadline 
that you have that you need finances to pay bills and so forth, we will keep that in consideration when we are moving grain. But allow us to do some bargaining with that grain instead of forced sales. Because if you're on a cash flow basis, and I'm sure that most of you are at this time, that you're going to know ahead of time that you're going to need funds next year to plant a crop, that you're going to need fertilizer, fuel, and so forth. And that's what we need is comprehensive planning, not only on your production end, but also on the selling end. And we can do it in bargaining. Thank you. I think I'm going to break right in here, not, and I don't want any of you to leave. That's not the kind of a break, but I think we're going to break the proceedings. I thought that there had been more of you that might have heard the presentation, and it's really what we are all about. We are a new system. The old system has got to go. The old system can't provide us with the marketing system we have to have in, for grain. Vance Combs is, uh, has a presentation, and we have it on tape, and I suspect we can get it taped again today if this one comes out better than the last one. But I think it would be well for all of you to listen to and those that have heard him, it won't hurt to hear him again. But it's a treat to, for me to listen to him, and I'm sure it will be for all of you. So at this point, I'd like to break what we have been doing and put Vance on and give us his presentation of what a system is all about. Maybe it'll help us all understand more. Vance is from uh, Pasco, Washington. On that as being a fact. And the other, second one is, if a system fails, there's, you have complete and utter chaos. And that's, not garbage, that is a fact. And I think if we ever had a chaotic situation, it was when the grain trader system did fail and we didn't have another ready. And we experienced worldwide chaos in the grain industry for about three years. And then the other one is the story of the American farmer and the plague that he's brought on himself. We are that group who hold a basic and essential commodity to a basic industry. We are the group that is not contractible. We are not contractible on the basis of a fair profit. And therefore, the grain trader, in order to fill his commitments, has to force it out of us by repressive measures or low prices, forcing us to come to the market with most or all of our grain each year in order to pay our bills. Now, and later on, we're going to use this when we get into the grain trader system. And I think if we accept these three basic laws as fact, then we can really accomplish something and very soon. Now let's get into systems. What they are, we live in a world of them. We have a postal system and a transportation system and a, a Federal Reserve system that charges too much interest and uh, we have a whole lot of systems school system that doesn't do too good a job teaching. But nowhere have I ever heard of, or have I experienced myself, a system that was designed for and by farmers. We constantly serve another's system. Therefore, we take the consequences. I'm gonna give you a couple of simple examples of a system. Didn't much to them. And keep in mind all the time that a system can do exactly what it was designed to do and nothing more, nothing less, if you use it. It is not a human being and it can't change its direction. It must go in the direction in which you designed it to go. Now in the, in the procedures where the human element comes in, then you can have mistakes and blunders and changes. But the system itself, 
will do exactly what you designed it to do. I hold something here in my hand to demonstrate to you, and you say, what is that? And I say, that's a system. And you say, what does it do? And I said, it, the name of it is a hammer, and it drives nails. You take two boards, put them together, drive the nail through with a hammer, and you've taken two boards and made them into one. Well, what are those two things on the top? That's a corrective system built into the basic system to correct the mistakes you make with that thing. <laughs> and that's exactly what we do with our systems. We build shunts into them. If we run into trouble, it's automatically shunted over into a corrective area, and that's why we have document control in the R6 program. It's a shunt to take care of illegal documents coming to us. I hold another instrument here, and you say, what's that? And I say, that's another system. Well, what do you call it? It's a saw. You notice that it has teeth on one side and a handle back here, and I guarantee you, if you put it on a board and do this with it, you'll do exactly the opposite you did with a hammer. You'll take one board and make two out of it. But you know what you can't do? You can't drive a nail with that saw, and you have one hell of a time cutting a board in half with a hammer. <laughs> now that's an example to you that a system can do what it was designed to do, but nothing more and nothing less. And we constantly, as producers of agriculture, sit around and hope and wish that a system that was designed by and for a trader is ever going to do us any good. And we constantly and stubbornly refuse to accept our own system. And I see people sitting out here today who were reluctant. I didn't see very many hands come up when I saw all of the people in here who had signed all their grain, but I didn't see many contracts for sale go out either. Now that's a system. The other night I saw uh, a circus picture. And I've seen this act since I was a kid. He used to pack water to the elephants. I was poor, couldn't buy a ticket to get into the circus. That was a long time ago, too. But I go watch these people do this beautiful job of manipulating six or eight head of horses in a small area. They had a whip. And they could make those horses do anything they wanted to do with that whip. But the moment that that trainer laid that whip down, he better have, if he had six horses in there, he better have six people to take care of them because this control system was no longer functioning and there was no other system to take over. Those horses are all over that tent. But if you got six people there to take them to the head, you got another system to take over, you don't have chaos. You have control. And I give the, you these examples to demonstrate to you that it's not a big difficult, complicated system that you're facing. Simple systems are simple. They have to function, and anything that functions properly is simple. So now that we have discussed this, the systems and what they can do and what they can't do, let's take a good look at the grain trader system. Now, mind you, I am not condemning an international grain trader. We used to. We used to cuss them up one side and down the other. They were, they were the blame for everything. But when we got a good look at ourselves, we found that, and I closed my presentation the other night with this one, we have met the enemy, and he are us. Before I go into the grain trader system, I picked up something in the Sunday paper here the other day, and it says, question, please list the largest private companies in the U.S., their headquarters, and what business they are in. Some gal, Laura, from San Mateo, California. Answer, Cargill, Minneapolis. That's Minnesota, you fellas that are from Minnesota. You got Minneapolis up there, did you know it? Continental Grain Company, New York City. 
I got one to shake you. Farmers Union Grain of St. Paul, Minnesota. You fellows in Minnesota didn't know you had that one, did you? And you thought you owned it? It's privately owned. That's what it says here. Don't ask me why. Could be because GTH got into it some way, I don't know. But we're gonna talk about the grain trader system and I want to identify the fact that you, you have contributed enough of your sweat to make three grain companies the largest privately owned companies in the world. Now, uh, what does a grain a trader have to have? Any trader have to have. He has to have grain, doesn't he? Okay. If he, that's all he has to have, too, incidentally. The trader's got to have a telephone, a good-looking broad for a receptionist, and grain. You know, come to think about it, I'd like to become a grain trader. <laughs> I don't care whether I'm green or not. <laughs> so we've established that, that a grain trader has to have grain. He has to have an abundant supply of grain any place, any time he wants it. Or he's in trouble. He can't make commitments unless he's ensured that his system will supply that basic and does that commodity to him any place, any time he needs it. And how does he get it? He gets it with low prices. Because you see, and you've experienced, just as recently as 73, a time when you got a few bucks in your pocket and you wouldn't contract. So the minute that he, that system pays you a profit, it destroys itself. He is able to maintain his unlimited supply any place, any time. He wants it only when he keeps you and your price structure below your cost of production. Now I'm talking about the average producer. There are a few, perhaps 10 or 15 percent of the producers in the United States that are so far above average because of efficiency and size, et cetera, that at the present time, and they lay slide down the grease pole and become something like midway or six on a scale to one to 10, that they are making a few bucks. But most of the produ product has to come to town every year in order to, you'll have to put it in a hawk or something. You lose control of it in order to pay your bills. Now, what does a low price activate or aggravate or stimulate. Whenever you have a price that is less than your cost, there's an enormous effort put into research, plant breeding, get two more kernels on that head, get a smaller cob, plant breeding, genetics, chemistry, get bigger, bigger equipment, more acres, an exercise in futility that only an idiot would try to follow. Because why? You have price, you have costs, and you think you're going to close that gap with efficiency, so you move your efficiency up and your production up, and what happens? You, you don't have a lid on that price, so it moves away from you. And here you go. And every one of us sitting here today have been brainwashed into the assumption that you can catch that elusive price that you have no control over with efficiency. Now stop and think, folks. That isn't smart, is it? That's a jackass and the carrot on the end of a pole. <laughs> Not funny. Can 
Every time I realized that I was a farmer for many, many years, and then I go out and tell you people how smart I am, <laughs> I wouldn't believe me if I were you. <laughs> That's the way he gets it. The reason he has to do it that way is because we are uncontractable on the basis of a fair profit, so he has to keep us below a profit level in order to force it out of us. And we sit here and expect a system that is automatically designed to destroy itself if it pays you a profit to ever pay us a profit using their system. And when it destroys itself, as it did in 19, say, late 72 and 73, it's simple. There was enormous pressure put on the world grain supply. We had to move an enormous amount of grain over a year period, crop year period. The logistical problems were enormous. They had to cover early their commitments that they had made. You know, the greater the commitment, the earlier you have to, com you have to cover it because there's only so much out there. And they started to bid the price up to get it. They got it up high enough to where that poor boy grain, it was resealed for three and four years, crop years. Uh, it didn't cost you much. And when they got that grain up to around $1.80, $1.90, $2.20, an awful lot of credit was established with the local banker. <coughs> And you could go down and borrow money and buy your grain back. And that's what he, he, millions and millions and millions of bushels did. They returned to the producer. And when the, produ when the, when the trader who used that as a slush fund turned to CCC grain to fill his commitments, there wasn't enough there. So he had to continue to go into the country and bid the price up. And by the fall of 1973, it was at $5.55 in my area. Am I right? I have a man sitting right there who doesn't live very far from me. He's going to be one of your national directors this coming year. And he said yes, so you believe him. Don't believe me. <laughs> right, Mark? Now, they're paying $5.52 Northwest Coast for wheat that they sold for around $3. And we won't write contracts. We're, we got a holding action right there. We won't, we're, not, we're not contractable. You see, the grain trade woke up one morning and found out that their supply, that they had to have, their lifeblood that they had to have, was in the hands of an unpredictable, undisciplined mob. That you? And I used to use that, and then <clears throat> I couldn't get much of a laugh because it didn't make you feel too good, so I cleaned it up. <laughs> and I said that you are a group holding a commodity essential to a basic industry, and you're uncontractable on the basis of a fair profit. Therefore, it's going to be taken out of you by repressive means. You see, that's a nice way of telling you you're just nothing but a rabble, rousing mob. <laughs> nice ways to say things. And I don't clean many of my acts up. <laughs> so now that we understand that this system that was designed by and for the grain trader can't function for you. You've got to have your own system. You've got to quit serving in others. You've got to have a system so that when we get control of this thing again, we won't have chaos. We'll become contractable on the basis of a fair profit. Now let's take a look at the steps that were taken to put you back in your slammer, back in your cage. The first thing they did to try to fill their commitments was go to Canada and buy a bunch of $6 wheat and bring it over the Sioux line through Portland, North Dakota, and it wound up down in Minneapolis and Superior. Trainloads of it. There's people here from 
North Dakota that saw them coming through. I saw them coming through. You bet. And uh, we took a look and found them in the yards. But that didn't go down too well because you see they were paying six dollars to fill commitments that were perhaps made at four three bucks, and even Cargill couldn't do that very long. So the next thing that happened, we had a president of the United States that surfaced and decided he'd have put on an embargo. See, there's no way in the world you can build surpluses any faster than throwing on an embargo and then opening the gates and letting the imports come in. That's the fastest thing you can do, except one. Whenever that kicked back, the Japanese got upset about the embargo and went down to Brazil and started a new soybean factory. Well, then he came out and he said, um, he sent Kissinger to Europe to cancel out some contracts, and Asia to cancel some contracts, because we were in trouble there, and that embarrassed Lord Kissinger. He had to go ask somebody else for something once in his life, and he didn't like that, and you people embarrassed that man, and when you embarrassed Mr. Kissinger, he does things. He reacts. So they sat down and they got the president to surface again, and he raised his right hand. That guy was always raising his right hand. <laughs> and he said, I'll never have another embargo here if you people will go out and plant fence to fence, and you sure did. Because the next year you produced 2.2 billion bushels of wheat, and I think your highest production up to that time was around a billion seven hundred and eighty million bushel. About 400 million bushel more than you'd ever produced. And he said, in fact, Congress just passed a law that won't let me. If we've got, if you'll plant fence to fence and we have sufficient commodity here in the United States for our needs, then there can never be another embargo. But what did he do that fall? He didn't put on it. He, he kept his word. He didn't put on an embargo. He put on contract review. You remember that one? He let about 10 or 15 percent of the sales go out of the United States and held the rest, and he built for you in five months a 500 million dollar, sir, uh, 500 million bushel surplus in wheat. And if you'll remember real well the sounds that you heard about that time, you can remember the gate on your cage slamming as they put you back into it. <coughs> Don went to price because they came out in January of that year and they said acres times normal yield, planted acres times normal yield is going to equal 2.2 billion bushel of wheat. We got a little carryover. And we'll need about 1.9 billion to fill our commitments. We've got a three or four or five million bushel carryover, so we don't, we're in a comfortable position because you see all visible grain is available to the grain trade today. There is not one and not one, including us, not one organization producing wheat today and marketing and working in wheat that isn't serving the old system. So it's all available because it's below the cost of production again. Down with your prices. In January, when we didn't cut the wheat until the fall, they always kill your markets about eight or nine months ahead. I've seen this hog thing go through its cycle about four or five times since I've been in the NFO, and they always kill your hog price with bread sows. You go out and count all of this fool around that's been going on out in your hog lot. <laughs> and the thing that should be sure joy for them turns out to be a catastrophe for you. So that's about what they did. They did a whole lot of other things. They use a dime. It's one of their big tools to keep their system alive is a dime. A fella, well, I don't know which one of the boys it was here the other day, on the staff says to me, Vance, we were in a meeting. What's that contract for sale worth? That system, that R6 grain system, the new NFO grain system worth? And I said, well, Matter of simple arithmetic, 
There's 12 billion bushels of grain produced in the United States every year. And we're $2 short right across the board. That's $24 billion of spendable money that you folks are refusing to pick up. You're leaving it on the table every year. And you tell me how damn poor you are. Now, the economists tell us, and we believe them, that that money that's generated at that level has a factor of seven in the national economy. And my third grade arithmetic tells me that that's about $680 billion that we're taking out of the national product every year. Wait a minute. What, what's, what is seven times 24? 168 billion. There, I got it. <laughs> I said I was third grade arithmetic. Knock it off. <laughs> 168 billion dollars that you're costing the national economy. We wouldn't have a depression if you people would price grain. Nothing to do with hogs, milk. Grain producers can handle it. As soon as you decide that you're going to make a complete commitment to using your own system instead of theirs that destroys itself if it pays you a profit. Now, wishing and hoping for something like that is really an exercise in futility. That's worse than trying to close the gap on the price and cost of a factor uh, with efficiency when you don't control price. So now th let's take a look at oh, And incidentally, if you did get another dime, and that's what you're getting, most of you that are selling outside the organization, if, you're, if your mouth's big enough, if you can cause enough trouble by getting that dime, they'll give you the dime. But if you all got the dime, you'd wind up with a billion, two hundred million dollars on 12 billion bushel of grain. Now, I know I'm right on that one, because all I had to do was cut off a couple zeros. So we're settling for a, for a masterful billion, 200 million, when we are leaving $24 billion on the table. And what are they doing with that money? It isn't the fact that we're leaving it on the table that's so damaging. They're taking your money that they're underpaying you, and they'll never pay you until you make them and buying your farms, and buying your corporations, and broadening, the, broadening their base. That's what the Arabs are doing with their oil money that they're gutting you out with. They're, they're taking your money, they're overcharging for their product and bringing it over here and buying your land. They're doing the same thing with the money you're leaving on the table because you don't charge enough I don't mind them taking the money that I give them, but when I fail to take my fair share for my production, the cost of production plus a reasonable profit, and then come back and hit me with that, that's all my fault. So most of the problems that you and I face day to day, from the time we were born to the time they say the last words over us, and it isn't going to be long for me, most of the problems that we acquire and saddle on our backs during that period of time are self-made, but we constantly look for a patsy somewhere to blame it onto. Now let's take a good look at us once. And remember this, that whenever we achieve this end, we will feel very good because we have straightened our act and seen to it that the other guy straightened his. Now let's take a look at the R6 system. What does it do? I'm not going to get into it too deeply because there's certain basic things it has to do. What? When, we, when this was put together, it was put together on the concept that what does a system have to do? It, first, it has to take us from where we are to where we want to go. It has to achieve our goals. 
If it just takes us halfway across the creek and then we have to jump off the end of the bridge and swim the rest of the way and half of us drown getting there, that's not a good system. So it was conceived with this requirement. It had to take us from where we are to where we're going. It has to furnish to the grain trader an abundance of grain any place, any time he needs it. We're producers, not traders. We're the best producers in the world. Remember this. When you can sign a contract for price, you can sign a contract for all other things that are pertinent to the movement of that grain. I have people say to me, John, we had all that grain we'd have to have. It was 3.8 million or 2.8 billion bushels of grain if we're going to have 7 30 percent. What are we going to do with it? <laughs> there is a logistical system out here built by the grain trade that handles 12 billion bushel of wheat, uh, grain every year. It isn't going any place. It's still there. He'll perform for us if we have the strength to write the price for it. We'll have the strength to write the rest of the contract, right? Absolutely. That makes sense. So quit worrying about these things. You're the best, smartest producers, the most specialized people in the world when it comes to producing grain. And you don't know a damn thing about anything beyond that point. And remember that. I always say my mother told me when I was a young fella, if you're shooting crap, don't play poker. <laughs> so this system had to do that. It has to furnish that grain trader with all the grain he wants anytime he needs it, but at a contract price based on the profit. It has to have sections in it that has two sections. They're in there for a reason. Section one is a, the performing day-to-day -day part of this system. It has to furnish you your cash needs, your cash flow needs, your booze, fraud, and board money. <laughs> Three Bs. <laughs> it has to teach you how to use it. So you do that. I told it. We had one of our traders sitting, oh, here he is, sitting down here the other night. And I said, now, if you, uh, they, the traders, our, our, our bargainers don't like 800 bushel or 400 bushel sent in. They want to sell a big block. So tell them the next time you send in a pickup load, you want them to say, sell for you and say, hey, we're practicing on how to use our system, you see. And, and he'll take that. <laughs> but you've got to practice. See, we build a system, all of us together. Then we work it and we, and we put it together and then some knothead like me gets up and talks to you about it. See, I tell you, you tell me, I show you, you show me, or we work together in this thing. And then what do we do then? We don't just go home and forget it. We practice for, for proficiency. We must practice the use of this thing or when the avalanche of grain comes down on our head, we won't know what to do with it, will you? We won't have a cadre. And you guys ever in the service know what a cadre is? That's the guy who comes along and tells you where to pull up your pants and blow your nose and checks you for your false teeth and see if you got your handkerchief. Makes you straighten up and be a man. That's the cadre. And that's what you coordinators are doing. You've got to know this and be able to tell it like I'm telling it to you and you've got to know the reasons you're telling it. We want somebody in every county in the United States where they produce grain that can tell this story the way we're telling it, explain the system, and know what they're talking about and being a teacher. If there's a responsibility on the part of this staff stretched out across here, it is education. We are teachers. We can't come out and show you, shovel your grain. We are teaching you a system. And I hear people say, well, I don't like that damn Staley. If they throw him out, we can put our state together. And I don't like well, I don't say I don't like Al. He's too damn big not to like. <laughs> Where's the little fella? <laughs> you see, if you understand your system, what difference does it make? We're not dealing in personalities. We're dealing in systems and handling commodities and pricing them.
All the people who wish I would drop dead tomorrow wouldn't be bothered if they got their wish, would they? They could go right on working if you know your system. And incidentally, while I'm on this subject, how many of you people who have not been on the board of directors, and even some of you that have been on the board of directors of your local co-ops, were taught actually the integral working parts of the system? I didn't see any hands. You see, that's a, that is a, that's for the hierarchy to let you peons know how this thing works would be a catastrophe. <laughs> You'd make them quit serving that old system and build one for you. This is the only organization in the world that brings its membership in and teaches it the system. Insists that you learn it. The next time somebody says that damned NFO to you, you hit him right in the nose. <laughs> You'll be proud of the organization you belong to because it's the most honorable group in the United States today. I talked to a, a, a hippie group up in Washington one time. They came in and took over a university up there at Ellensburg over the holidays, and I talked to them. And they were riled up and mad and dressed down, and I dressed down, I put on this suit. <laughs> and I told them this, you are our minority, so are we. When you are a minority, you gotta get her done by yourself. And that's exactly what we're trying to do and you can't get somebody else to do it for you. And when you're a minority, you'll do as we have done. You will carry your wounded, and you will bury your dead. Because we have done exactly that. And they had done exactly that. But I reminded them this, that you'll carry less wounded and very fewer dead under this form of government than any other place under the sun. So be thankful for that because you can function within this system. You can and build and create your own systems and work with them. But when you're a minority, you gotta do it yourself. When you're the king, the servants will come to you. But when you are the servants, you go to the king. I quit being servants. Your system also has section two. Now, section one has a little manipulation that we haven't been using too much, and I'd like to uh, talk to you a moment about that. Every battle plan has an attack plan, it has a retreat, orderly retreat plan, and it also has reserves. And your system is designed in that manner. You can take out of section two, which only you can order out into section one for sale, blocks of grain. We can put them together on a national block on the basis of a commodity. Put them out there, offer them to the bargainers. If it doesn't go, you pull it back and put it in your section two, back in your bank. You shine it up. Bring it out the next time, next month. Offer it again. If it doesn't go, take it back, put it in section two. It's a yo-yo. Shine it up some more, give it another coat of paint, stick it out there. One of these days it's gonna big, get big enough to where somebody's gonna want that to fill his commitments. It's gonna get big enough to where it might, when you got 30%, it might short the whole cockeyed structure. And they gotta come in then to fill their commitments. Now that's how you can do in section one. Those are some of the things. And, and, and as you use it, you'll find a thousand ways that it will take care of your problems. A system is judged on whether or not it can handle a problem that arises. So you take the R6 program system, and any problem you have ingrained today, you spike it into that system, 
by using the system the way it's supposed to be used and see if it doesn't solve it. It will solve every problem that you have only if you use it. And you've got to have 30% of your grain or thereabouts to get the job done. The section two is your grain bank. Now, that's where you hold grain before you market it. And if you've got any sense at all, you're going to say, well, how are you going to put any grain in the bank if you have to take it all to town every year to pay your bills? That's why you got acres. I agree with you. We'll never accumulate any kernels of grain in Section 2 until we get the prices up above our cost of production, right? So what do they kill us with every year? They come out about January the 1st and say, planted acres times normal yield.